Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, Ritika Changya, Associate Director of Crystal. Welcome all of you to the Crystal webinar on the electric vehicle ecosystem, titled The Route to Clean Mobility. The webinar will have a presentation followed by a panel discussion with industry experts and a Q&A session. We will start with the webinar with a presentation by Mr. Hamil N. Thakkar, Director Crystal, on the current EV ecosystem in India and the way forward. We also have with us Mr. Jagan Narayan Padmanabhan, Practice Head, Transport, Logistic and Mobility Crystal, who will be joining us for the panel discussion and Q&A session. I would also like to inform you that the webinar is being recorded. Besides, we are very glad to have an esteemed panel of leaders who have joined us as panelists today. I warmly welcome Mr. Randhir Singh, Director, Electric Mobility and Senior Team Member for Advanced Chemistry Cells Program, Niti Aayog. Mr. Dejo Grafi, Chairman and Managing Director, Piaggio Vehicles Private Limited. Dr. Dev Mukherjee, Managing Director, Omega Seeky Mobility. Mr. Puneet Goyal, co-founder, Blue Smart Mobility. Mr. Akash Gupta, co-founder and CEO, Zip. Thank you all panelists for taking your precious time out for the webinar. Electric mobility today is the subject of much curiosity world over. Public policy globally and in India have been the key driver to support increased adoption of electric vehicles to reduce pollution and to decarbonize the transport sector. In India, the PLI schemes for advanced chemistry cell and uh, the auto and auto component industry, along with PAIM scheme and multiple other benefits of the state and central government, have today made electric vehicles price competitive vis-a-vis -vis an ICE vehicle on a total cost of ownership basis for some of vehicle segments such as two-wheeler and three-wheeler. The deliberations today would focus on bringing forward many interesting facets of the industry and the challenges impeding growth. I will now hand over to Hamil, who will take you through the presentation. Over to you, Hamil. Thank you, Ritika. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, industry colleagues, and eminent panelists. It's a pleasure to have you all. Three-wheelers, buses, and two-wheelers are to drive electrification in India. If you actually see the EV penetration in sales for three-wheelers has almost reached the 5% mark. In case of two-wheelers, it is almost 2%. In case of buses, it is almost like 4%. But in case of passenger vehicles, it's still lower than 1%. However, if you see, it has grown more than three times as compared to what we've seen last year. If you look at the last couple of years, the growth in the recent times has been much higher. And if you look at recent months, segments like two-wheelers have seen almost 3% penetration in terms of sales as compared to 2%, which we are seeing in our average for the year till date. As we move forward, what we've also tried to understand is which are the districts or cities you know, that are largely driving electrification in India. If you actually see with respect to two-wheelers, uh, three wheelers, passenger vehicles and buses, you can see one common city, which is Bangalore Urban. Now, Bangalore Urban stands tall across all districts in India, proving why it is called the startup capital in India. People in Bangalore have the tendency to explore newer ideas faster than anywhere else in India, which is clearly reflecting in numbers. Also, if you see carefully, you will see a lot of cities or districts, you know, which are based out of Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Gujarat, you know, in the top districts. This one reason for this is most of these states are providing subsidies over and above, you know, the fame subsidy that is provided by the government of India and which has led to faster adoption of electric vehicles in these categories. As we move forward, if you actually see what has led to growth in electrification, largely from policy and regulation perspective, so you will actually see that the government of India introduced fame one in fiscal 16 where the incentives were largely applicable across vehicle segments, but even for lead acid batteries and low speed vehicles. There was a change in the last six months, you know, when the fame one was coming to an end, despite that 2.8 lakh vehicles got registered under that particular scheme. In fame two, there were modifications made where incentives were proposed only for high speed vehicles and the ones which were on lithium ion. And because of which, you know, we've seen faster proliferation post fame coming in. Especially steps like enhancement of subsidies for E2 wheelers and the same coinciding with petrol prices breaching 100 per litre in several districts in India has led to faster proliferation. 
CNG too has seen a huge pull up on on because of this, especially in passenger vehicles, three wheelers, and buses, on account of flaring fuel prices. Further, phased manufacturing plan and production linked incentive scheme, which the government has you know kind of launched, will drive localization in India and will not only help in reducing costs but also build our competitiveness in making us a strong base from an electric vehicle and EV components export perspective. At USD 15 billion or so, we are less than one percent of global trade in automotive components across the globe, and this will provide a huge fillip. Also, as discussed in the earlier slide, several states have complemented the central government's FAME policy, which has helped in faster proliferation in terms of electric vehicles across segment. Now, when we look at how localization has panned out in India. especially you know the government of india has taken a very strong step in the form of phased manufacturing plan which has led to localization if you actually see battery pack and bms which is the heart of the electric vehicle like engine in case of ice our dependence on imports for manufacturing battery cells is high and would continue to be so for some time however the government of india has set up a joint venture company named kabal that is khanij bidesh india limited which will ensure seamless access to basic raw material required for cell manufacturing recently our honorable prime minister has announced a tie up with australia's critical minerals facilitation office which will establish a framework for joint investments in australian projects for mine to mine critical minerals like lithium cobalt vanadium to name a few which is crucial to manufacture of not only electric vehicles but also certain other consumer electronics like mobile phones high tech application items and also solar panels india is increasingly turning to australia and other sources to cut its dependence on china which dominates about 80% of global critical minerals production india australia and japan have also a working group on creating resilient supply chains that focuses on critical minerals localization to a significant extent has been achieved in traction motor and controller as well as dc dc converter we perceive that over the next 3 to 5 years we may surpass 80% localization levels at an industry level with respect to electric vehicles largely because of dependence on basic raw materials where you know we will still be dependent on imports but apart from that i think localization to a great extent would be achieved now let's move further and look at how the total cost of ownership is shaping up if you actually see even at a mere running of 6000 kilometers for two wheelers annually and 20000 kilometers of running for three wheelers annually you know these electric vehicles have attained parity with ais or in fact they are better in terms of total cost of ownership of course this is post considering the fame subsidy now what is very important is if you look at 2026 with the reduction in battery prices that we are expecting to see going forward we will actually see that even without subsidy by 2026 these vehicles that is two wheelers and three wheelers would probably attain parity because at this point of time fame subsidy is only applicable till fiscal 24 passenger vehicles will see strong traction towards cng and ev penetration will see a 5 to 6 fold increase as compared to what we are seeing today innovative solutions like battery swapping will further add fuel to the growth of ev three wheelers in space seeing is on the commercial vehicle segment we strongly feel that a subsidy for small commercial vehicles and intermediate commercial vehicles would help in faster proliferation of three of of you know kind of these vehicles like in three wheelers as these vehicles are used for commercial applications and the more they sweat their vehicle the faster they achieve the parity with respect to ais vehicles also for the buses segment continuing subsidies beyond fiscal 24 will be helpful and will help faster proliferation and reduce pollution in cities on account of public transport so what is it that we see in terms of challenges that the industry is facing today we have broadly classified challenges in three buckets first demand side challenges second supply side challenges and third ecosystem challenges if you actually see most of the challenges today are on account of the industry being at a very nascent stage and we have seen this earlier also and every industry faces teething issues and we believe these teething issues will be addressed in the next couple of years we also believe that the focus that the government of india is having on the industry 
and with policies like production linked incentive scheme battery swapping and bringing evs under priority sector lending a large part of these challenges would be addressed over the medium term also niti aayog is working on urban mining which will take care of environmental issues largely referred to as you know recycling of batteries i'm sure randeer will throw some light on it during the panel discussion if you also see because of electric penetration increasing in india we have seen that there is there are newer avenues which have emerged and new business models have come up battery as a service and public charging stations is something which have seen increase adoption this will not only reduce the initial outgo for the customer but also improve viability and address range anxiety issues this will also lead to better asset utilization pay per use model has become more prominent and you will see players like sun mobility lithium power volt up these people have become very very prominent in this space also on the charging station side you have players like blue smart the other thing that is coming up is mobility as a service where the principal focus is on shared mobility by linking your operations by also deploying charging infrastructure again on a pay per use model again you have players like blue smart lithium iron in this space and we are fortunate that we have puneet here you know who'll throw some light on it during the panel discussion the third model that we are seeing evolving is micro mobility largely from the perspective of last mile delivery here the principal focus is you know micro rental of vehicles or you know vehicles which can be used on a self drive mode or open source business model where users can hire as well as deploy vehicles as per the requirement again notable players who are present in this space include zip bounce yulu and you know we are happy that akash from zip is participating in the panel discussion and we'll throw some more light on this if you see what is the outlook that we see with respect to two wheelers and three wheelers going forward i spoke about total cost of ownership i spoke about the steps that the government of india is taking to ensure that there is proliferation of electric vehicles going forward if you actually see two wheelers and three wheelers are going to be the biggest beneficiaries and mass market vehicles like two and three wheelers will actually gain a lot from these steps that have been taken we expect at least a 14 to 15% penetration in terms of electrification in terms of total sales of two wheelers sold by fiscal 26 in case of two wheelers in case of three wheelers it will be even higher to the tune of about 27 28% in case of passenger vehicles to the tune of 4 to 5% and in case of buses to the tune of 5 to 6%. Now what is very important is if you look at two wheelers per se, larger proportion of electrification will come from scooters. Motorcycles will see slower adoption because of two reasons. One largely being rural focus, scooters largely being urban focus. Motorcycles more from a commute perspective but scooters more from, you know, last mile delivery or last mile uh, movement perspective and that is the reason we expect penetration in scooters to be higher as compared to motorcycles now because of this how do we see the opportunity panning out in various segments across the automotive industry if you look at automotive companies we believe that you know only in fiscal 26 we'll see an opportunity size of about 70000 crores coming from electrification across segments for financials it will be about 40000 crores for insurance insurance people it will be about 5000 crores and for shared mobility 20000 crores now what is very important is when you look at the cumulative numbers for the last 4 years or so right from fiscal 22 to 26 if we've seen largely that financiers participation in the overall scheme of things currently is low largely in the organized space and organized nbfcs we are seeing new age nbfcs and fintechs participating in the financing so in a way there is an opportunity loss of 90000 crores that we will be seeing if we do not participate in this opportunity going forward over the next 3 to 4 years similarly in case of insurance it's to the tune of about 11000 crores and shared mobility we expect that in the next 3 to 4 years the market size would be almost about 40000 crores only with respect to electric vehicle mobility with this i conclude my presentation i'll now hand it over to jagannara and padmanabhan who will handle the panel discussion thank you over to you jagat thank you hemal for such an uh, insightful presentation now we move on to our next section that's the panel discussion 
as we begin the panel discussion, I would like to inform that during the course of our discussion, we would also be running a poll to know the participants view on the sector. So participants kindly participate in this poll and give your uh, valuable feedback. So now we begin our panel discussion and the key, which is the key highlight of the webinar. Uh, as introduced by Ritika, we have an eminent panel. And today I'm quite proud to introduce them. We have Mr. Randeer Singh, Director, Electric Mobility and Senior Team Member of uh, for Advanced Chemistry Cells Program, Niti IO. We have Diego Graffi, uh, Chairman and Managing Director, Piaggio Vehicles. We have Mr. Dave, Dr. Dave Mukherjee, Managing Director, Omega C Key Mobility. We have Mr. Puneet Goyal, Co-Founder, Blue Smart Mobility. And we have Mr. Akash Gupta, Co-Founder and CEO, Zip. So once again, sir, uh, we thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Uh, Randeer Singh. Uh, so Mr. Singh, uh, what is advanced chemistry cells localization potential in India and what factors uh, impact it vis-a-vis -vis global competition? Thanks, Jagan, and thank you for having me here. Uh, in fact, as we speak today, uh, let us start from the, you know, in a reverse order. Uh, today we have released the PIV also, wherein who are the beneficiaries. Of course, it is known for the last three, four days when the bid uh, was final successful bidders. So, uh, Five gigawatt hour, uh, sorry, uh, Ola, 20 gigawatt hour has gone to the Hyundai and the five gigawatt hour has gone to the Reliance. Overall, 50 gigawatt hour is uh, being distributed among these four. Uh, but the biggest part is not only these four are going to put, in fact, a uh, couple of days back, even the Suzuki has announced that they are going to put their uh, factory. That is around the five gigawatt hour with the investment of around 6,700 crore in uh, battery side and rest, uh, uh, rest to the EV side. So overall 10,000 crore is what they are going to put. So this ACC PLI in itself has given a nudge for the production and the establishment of the supply chain within this country, which was earlier absent. So in the next, of course, it will take some time, next two to three years, when we are going to see the localization of the supply chain, localization of the materials, which uh, the possible materials. So if I just break down uh, the cell from the ACC perspective, uh, the cost of the cell. So 51% is actually the cathode and 24% is the manufacturing and the depreciation. Around 12% is anode, 7% is separator, 4% is electrolyte, and 3% is only battery housing. This 3% is what is happening right now in our country. And our aim is to move from this 3% to at least 60 to 65% in the next five years after the letter of award for these uh, people, uh, these four uh, successful bidders. So the overall objective of this ACC PLI is not only to localize, but also to get the cost parity with respect to the international suppliers and the producers. Right now, when we say $137 per kilowatt hour cost, which has reached last year to the 2021 for LFP, the same, so, uh, sorry for the interruption. So the same is not available in India. Why? The reason is there's no supply chain available. There's no localization available. Of course, Raw material perspective, not every country has the raw material, but then 80% of the things still can be localized. And that is what the low hanging fruit this ACC PLI is going to bring on table. And this is what we will see in the next two years, 25% localization after that plus three years, that means letter of award plus five years, the 60% localization. This is what advanced chemistry cell is going to bring uh, here. Excellent. This will cool. bring efficiency. This will bring higher water hour per kg and more life cycle. No, excellent. And I think that gives a great overview of what you, you know, what India is planning to kind of achieve. Uh, to jump in and get Mr. Diego uh, in this. Uh, sir, on the swappable batteries, you know, it's a great concept. Uh, just now, there's been lower acceptance in India uh, in the EV three-wheeler space. So what are, you, what are the challenges you think that they are facing currently and uh, how I think that we can be addressing this. And also, what are the kind of expectations uh, that you have uh, from the battery swapping policy of uh, GOI, or what are the challenges around that? 
Uh, okay, first of all, thanks, uh, Crazy, for inviting me to this uh, to this panel today. Okay, coming to, to straight to your point, uh, um, yes, the other we are strong supporter of battery swapping model. In general, as a uh, effective way of boosting electric mobility, not only for three wheeler and two wheeler. Worth to mention that we have been the first player to introduce a swappable model in three wheeler space in uh, end of 2019 uh, with our upper city in swappable uh, version and uh, also in uh, we have one of the players in the consortium in Europe uh, for definition of a standard of battery swap applied to two wheel. So uh, say, say that uh, the challenges uh, definitely are there. Okay, let's see which are the pros and cons of a battery swap model respect to a fixed battery model. Definitely the pros are that battery swap uh, as, a, as, a, as a philosophy is removing uh, the two big roadblocks that are still there in customer mindset to, to adopt uh, electric, uh, electric version instead of IC version. One is range anxiety because battery swap required operation required only two minutes at the battery swap station and you do not have to wait long time for recharging your battery on board. And second is the cost of acquisition of a vehicle because battery Pack that is one of the sometimes 40% of the contribution of the total price or industrial cost of a three wheeler is excluded from the, uh, how to say, the ownership of a customer and is a sort of rent model that you subscribe with a service provider or battery soul. The cons definitely are related to the fact that infrastructure for battery soap is much more expensive. Uh, because it, it, it requires also special, special care in terms of electric connection, uh, space available for doing battery support operations. So uh, I think that going forward, if uh, with the new battery support policy that the new government has declared, there will be also special chapter dedicated to incentivization of infrastructure for battery soap that will enable Far from all the adoption of this kind of model in India, not only for three wheeler, but also for two wheeler. Uh, there are two factors that I see are fundamental for this. One is uh, somehow a sort of standardization, uh, because having battery model that can be adopted uh, interchangeable between three wheeler, two wheeler and four wheeler can create that economy of scale that is uh, giving uh, economic advantage also for the players that want to invest in this, in this sector. And second, second aspect is related definitely, as we said also, of supply chain. Supply chain increase of localization of components and support to the faster adoption of electric mobility. If these two factors are going to happen in the next future. I think that uh, battery swap, if not prevailing to fixed battery model, but at least at par with fixed battery model in three wheeler space, uh, can in the span of the next three to five years is something that is uh, quite uh, possible to be expected. Sure. Thank you. I think giving a time frame by which this will happen, uh, so that, that's that's uh, quite insightful. Uh, let me come back to Mr. Randir. I, I think he uh, has an urgent call from the ministry to kind of move ahead. So I'll, I'll just involve you initially, and, and then we'll come to the other panelists quite quickly. Uh, Mr. Randir, uh, specifically on this uh, battery swapping part of it, what business models uh, do you think uh, are going to be evolving under this landscape? What are things which want to work? Uh, if you can just throw some color on that, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks, Jagan. Uh, so from the battery swapping perspective, uh, next week we will be coming out with a draft which will be shared with the industry and then we will have another Round of consultation. Now, the, from the you know the business model perspective, what we see within India is Kirana stores at the look at the petrol pumps, petrol bunks, four by four, three by three. Those type of battery swapping stations are going to proliferate the entire you know the, uh, the area. Next thing is the you know the subscription model. Subscription model from the two perspective. First is OEM or the battery swapping uh, charge point operators. They provide a subscription directly to the customers. This is one. Second is that charge point operators, they don't own the asset. Either the OEMs own the asset. OEMs means either the battery side or the vehicle side. They own the asset. They lease this to the Kirana guy or anybody else who just puts in 
the power connection and this land nothing else no money from his side and he earns from them those type of models what about 4 by 4 3 by 3 or 2 by 2 matrix so those type of models will evolve as i speak i am actually uh, 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 we have interacted with many people in this space uh, since we did this pre draft consultation since then till now almost i must say 50 to 55 companies has personally given the you know uh, uh, presentations to us discussions with us the written feedback and all uh, in this particular space they they include the startup the established players the sun mobility bounds you know the honda all of these guys so the space is not only evolving but lot of funding is also coming in this so the different subscription models funding from uh, different people availability of the land and the uh, you know uh, engagement with the battery uh, not only the battery oems but also with the omcs oil marketing companies so uh, uh, of days back we were talking with the iocl and other people and they very clearly said that they are having the tires with some of the biggest battery swappers in our country as of now and they are going to put these out of those 22000 uh, you know the charging stations which has already been announced so the space is going to be flooded with the uh, battery swap stations and we will see the proliferation of the evs because of this uh, in our country for sure and battery as a service which includes the you know the fixed part also so we will be coming out with the norms for that also when we discuss the next week uh, with the draft uh, and uh, entire industry will be called in the in different cohorts we'll be talking to them also yeah so so i had a particular order of it but uh, I, i think you're running late on 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 your next part of it so i just take a minute and ask the next one um, and and then probably we'll let you go is what is your take on uh, used batteries uh, from the evs uh, because you know that's an important topic in terms of the whole uh, sustainability part and other aspects uh, so what's your take on that yeah uh, this is actually very very important part without this complete recycling and reuse both the things we will not be in a position to do this transition sustainably so that's why in you know in a couple of weeks we will be coming out with one report potential in this country plus the battery management rules the draft which was announced last year soon moefcc will come out with the final version second thing third thing is about in this particular space there has to be epr responsibility which has to be fixed that means extended production responsibility has to be fixed so in our policy part itself we will be putting all these things so the recycling and the reuse both has to be go together and in case of the evs first is reuse then the recycling that means the second use of the weaker, uh, this battery has to happen and then only we will talk about the recycling but the norms around this the potential within our country and uh, you know the there are certain brackets because two technologies pyro and the hydro in the recycling which is right now being prevalent around the world not both can sustain at every place if we have to get minimum 95% of the minerals which were originally there we need to have the technology which is sustainable within our country also and certain pockets it shouldn't happen that we put up the recycling plant and they they are also polluting the environment So all those aspects will be taken care, and soon we will be coming out with the reports. In a couple of weeks, in fact, Niti Aayog is going to launch one report uh, in coordination with the UK FCTO. Great, thank you. So I think, I think initially we wanted to just get the whole policy perspective in, and, and that's why we involved um, Mr. Randeep quite extensively. We just quite start jumping in uh, into the other panelists. Uh, sorry to keep you, uh, the other panelists, waiting, uh, Mr. Dev, uh, to kind of get back into what we started off in, in terms of the whole. uh swappable battery part of it and specific to you because you are uh have success in both the swappable batteries uh and, and the fixed one options part of it so what defines the success uh, for both these options and what are the challenges also faced uh, for a person who has been executing it so from the uh from your side how do you see this yeah jagan thank you very much uh, first of all and good afternoon to all my fellow panelists it's great to be um here and uh, 
present my views. See, first of all, we have to see the whole industry landscape. Uh, particularly in a country like India, you need to give choice and options to the customers. So it's there is never a one size fit all kind of strategy which can be successful in a uh, market like India because of the sheer diversity of the market, the uh, length and width of the country, then the dynamics of city, rural, semi-rural, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a very uh, sort of a uh, you know a diverse kind of market uh, landscape that uh, India offers. So uh, in this context, I think we have to have options like fixed battery, swap battery, rapid charge battery, fast charge, and I don't know, tomorrow maybe something else. So you need to present as many options as uh, possible to uh, cater to different segments. Now, commercial vehicles, you know, the uh, first and foremost challenge is to have as much uh, uptime as possible because you get paid uh, based on the the uptime. So obviously the downtime has to be as low as possible and that is where swap comes in handy because in just five minutes or so you are able to um, uh, you know change the battery and uh, go on your way. So I think the opportunities if you ask me the opportunities are uh, uh, you know immense because uh, we have close to half a million market of uh, three wheelers in this country and slowly as we are seeing the adoption happening uh, fast. I do see that uh, this year we are going to see, uh, uh, you know, quite a big uh, uh, rapid change in three wheelers particularly. So I do see that uh, battery swap is going to be a huge opportunity. Um, the uh, Also the alignment of, um, you know, the oil companies, uh, it, it is heartening to see all of them now coming forward and offering to set up uh, swap or charging. Now swap uh, happens uh, easily because you don't have to wait, uh, you know, in your vehicle for four or five hours, which is a problem if you have to have a swap uh, a charging station in a petrol pump. Whereas swap can happen, so swap stations can be, uh, you know, set up across the length and width of the country in these kind of uh, ready-made uh, sort of infrastructure of uh, gas stations, petrol stations, etc. Uh, that is uh, one of the opportunity. I think the uh, challenges are broadly, you know, you can have uh, in two categories. One is the technology challenge where the interoperability, portability pro- protocols and uh, the type of connectors you have, etc. And the same battery can be used for two wheeler as well as three wheeler. So these are the challenges which technology has to solve. And as the technologies evolve, uh, I'm sure this will be taken care of maybe in the next two to three years. And I do see standardization coming into the industry. Second challenge category is the economics. Obviously, end of the day, it has to make economic sense. So in this case, the uh, battery, although, uh, I mean, battery swap offers, um, uh, you know, the cost of the upfront cost uh, lower, significantly lower than the fixed battery. But then the swap owner has to set up uh, uh, and uh, cater for the extra number of batteries that has to be in circulation. So unless you have a minimum uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, optimized number of vehicles, so probably it is a challenge today. Also getting the infrastructure on the ground, as we know, is always a, a challenge in India yeah. when you when you start to put put things on the ground, everything matters, you know, from right from land to infrastructure to electricity and approvals and permits, et cetera, et cetera. I think those are the basically the challenges that I see, but I do see that opportunities as well as challenges in equal proportion. And I do see, uh, you know, battery swapping will uh, be a significant portion of the market along with the other options of fixed and rapid, et cetera. That's my view. Excellent. Excellent. No, I think that's that's pretty aptly put. That everything coexists, so it's not one one thing aspect is there. Uh, moving on to uh, Puneet, uh, you know, one of the key aspects as a user, even if you have to use it, is range anxiety that we usually have, right? Uh, what better way than to look at it uh, from? Typically, you would compare if you were to see from a taxi kind of a thing. Uh, so typically the leads travel by our Ola or Uber per day is about 150 to 200 kilometers. Uh, your fleet consists of only EVs, right? So how are you able to manage the charging of your fleet having limited range and lean charging network options which are available today? So I think that will give an insight to the larger population as well. 
uh, on how these uh, range anxiety can be uh, accommodated. Sure. So thank you so much for your question. Um, you know, so we have seen since we started uh, back in 2019, the first set of cars that we got, uh, which were called the Gen 1 cars, the Generation 1 cars, those cars had a much lower range. Uh, the challenges were obviously there. So we didn't open those cars to a wider geography. We limited those cars to a smaller geography. As we continue to onboard now Gen 2 and Gen 3 cars, the range has gone up from 140 kilometers on a single charge uh, for these four wheelers. Now they're north of about 220 kilometers on a single charge. Uh, and as we onboard newer cars, which are Gen 4 cars from other manufacturers, including Tata Motors and MG, the range has gone north of 250 kilometers. Some cars have obviously today have range of north of 300 kilometers. Uh, when we were building the entire business model of Blue Smart and writing the white paper, we knew from day one that this is just not about mobility, it's all about mobility, uh, energy infrastructure and charging. And if you do three things right, you can run a full stack, fully electric ride hailing service. So besides today having India's largest fleet of 1,100 electric cars on the BlueSmart platform, we also have 800 charging stations. So we also operate India's largest EV uh, super hubs, uh, network of EV super hubs. At each EV super hub of BlueSmart, you can park and charge hundreds of cars. And we also uh, enter into a joint venture partnership with GOBP uh, on the World Environment Day 2021. Uh, and under this joint venture partnership with GOBP, we are setting up thousands of charging stations across Delhi NCR. So we have access to uh, charging infra. And, uh, and that's the backbone of the Blue Smart's ride hailing fleet. Uh, and as use cases is uh, getting more validated with each passing quarter, we are opening the geographies of Delhi NCR. So when the fleet size scales to 4,000 cars, when we have access to more charging infra, we'll be opening the uh, uh, opening the entire uh, Delhi NCR geography uh, as a market for for Blue Smart. Currently, each car is still able to do 200 kilometers on a single charge. We see that the competition with dry run, including dry run, runs about 220 kilometers on the day. Where it could be 160 kilometers, could be uh, trip kilometers and 40, 50 kilometers of dry run. Uh, Blue Smart is able to do that today with the significant challenges of, uh, of, of limited range of electric cars because of the way we are building up business models. So business model is solving for the challenges of, of range. Uh, and Gen 4 cars will absolutely not need intraday charging. You can probably do charging at night because uh, the base case is covered by the range of the car. That's great. I mean, it's heartening to note that uh, increasingly this would uh, be taken care of. Uh, and and uh, I think that will also aid in faster adoption of EV in, in the general public as well. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, getting on uh, to you, Akash, uh, what do you think the role of state policies which are there in pushing electrification, especially when certain states have announced targets for compulsory conversion of certain proportion of their fleet to EVs for you know, the last mile uh, distribution part which is there? So I think uh, you know, states coming in and, and kind of bringing in, and currently, you, you, if you have seen Bombay uh, or Mumbai has kind of talked about net zero uh, emission being there. So things like that uh, are also shaping up. So what is the importance of the state policies? Can you enumerate on that? Yeah. Thanks, Jagan, and hello to the fellow panelists. Uh, thanks, uh, Crystal, for having me here. Uh, very interesting, uh, you know, question that you asked again about state policy. So, so I think one of the things which is very clearly coming out is that both the center and state are together on the electrification agenda, right? That's coming out very, very, you know, sharply, uh, you know, because there's a central subsidy, which is a fame to, uh, which is getting extended and being passed on and very, very highly adopted. And that has given a huge cusp of growth to the entire electric mobility segment over the last one year. At the same time, we've seen now the two uh, largest, uh, I would say, uh, state governments of the country. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, call them two largest, but yeah, uh, um, uh, like Mumbai as the financial capital and Delhi being the, uh, you know, central capital of the country, right? Those two governments are very, very positive about, uh, you know, one, they're having their own state subsidy on top of the central subsidy, which is very, very welcome, right? Uh, and hence bringing the entire uh, vehicle cost from a buying perspective for, for individuals and businesses to be quite affordable. Uh, and the second thing which is uh, now coming out is the push for aggregators and logistics players to go 100% electric, right? So which is a very, very welcome step. 
Uh, we are talking to a lot more other state governments. But what I see is that once Delhi and Maharashtra make a pact on, you know, this kind of a policy, I think all the other states should follow through, right? And there are uh, agencies definitely like Crystal, there's Yes Bank, there are many other, uh, you know, uh, such agencies who are helping government to carve out uh, these uh, right policies for a faster EV adoption. In fact, some of these uh, states are also uh, welcoming to create the, uh, you know, home charging kind of norms, uh, swapping norms, which are ahead uh, versus the central, um, you know, policies. So, so these are welcome steps. And I think all of this is working towards a faster adoption, which is what all of us, you know, young startups are working towards. Okay. I think uh, you've talked about the whole uh, subsidy part of it, but I just want to get uh, DHO into the whole part on in terms of uh, the funding and, and part of that. See, more than 95% of uh, I's uh, three-wheelers are uh, funded. So, you know, in, in the sense that they, they do access uh, some form of banking or NBFC uh, for getting it up and running. Uh, so, I, I so I should ideally be the case, and you know that uh, for the three wheelers on the EV part of it, how do you see the whole funding part of uh, the thing? Uh, because many of them are not comfortable; uh, the financiers are not comfortable funding swappable battery uh, vehicles versus the fixed uh, ICE vehicles or the fixed battery vehicles is there. And how are you addressing this thing? Uh, see, uh, that's a very, very delicate, a very important point because basically the demand of the wheeler, as you call the street, remember, is more than all other segments in automotive, uh, street linked uh, in terms of last mile mobility of uh, the student trucks and whatever. So it's very much linked to the availability of effective consumer financing support to the final consumer due to the profile of a customer and due to the how to say, the, the, the price, acquisition price of the vehicle. And this has become, this link has become even more important after Para 6 introduction because we have seen a huge hike in terms of price of acquisition of the wheeler across all segmented, across all power train solutions. Uh, plus COVID uh, definitely have got uh, a big hit in terms of uh, in general, reluctancy of financial to support the three-wheeler demand because many vehicles have been halted, uh, forcibly halted in terms of operation during the during various rounds of lockdown. Definitely this has not, and at the same time, let me say, electrification of three-wheeler started in the, the country. So definitely this has not been, how to say, a, a good starting point. And that's the main reason why, as you quite said, uh, still a lot of players in the financial, financial community, depending if we are private bank and BFC or small financials, they are willing to take uh, uh, electric three-wheeler in, 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 in a financing model. Uh, but I see that the, the, the response is very, is quite mixed uh, in the sense that uh, some of them uh, of showing a lot of enthusiasm because it's, uh, it's a new technology, it's a clean technology, they are keen to support, uh, how to say, India transition to electric mobility. Some of them instead are quite, uh, quite reluctant, even more than for IC, due also to the lack of uh, somehow credit history for most of the customer in this kind of technological solution, plus uh, due to the link of uh, the question mark in terms of resale value of the vehicle. So, I think that, uh, again, uh, some, uh, as, uh, as uh, Hamal was remembering in, the, in his uh, very, very nice presentation, was that maybe uh, putting uh, financing of electric uh, three-wheeler or passenger car or two-wheeler under uh, priority land on sector for MBSC could be a good move going forward that will give a further enabler for, uh, let me say, transition to, 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 to electric mobility into three-wheel space. I think it's something that could, could really help giving more motivation to financial, to, to participate, to participate in this, uh, in this, uh, in this task. Because as I said, I see a lot of them that are keen, but uh, reluctant to, 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 so it's a, it's a mixed kind of response or mixed kind of sentiment when we talk about electric wheel. So I think this could be definitely a good move going forward that could uh, give a good boost to adoption of uh, EV into three-wheel space. 
Excellent, excellent, great. Uh, so just on the topic of finance, uh, if I can get Puneet. So leasing in India uh, is not as accepted as in the West. You know, you have all your vehicles on lease. So how do you manage the same and what would be your learnings, uh, which could be, you know, as an input to the other stakeholders uh, to come up with more leasing options uh, going forward? Yeah, so we had to come with this uh, supply side innovation because we knew that the other two incumbents, uh, which are uh, which are running the ride healing companies, have a different business model. In their case, they depend on drivers to bring cars on the table. We essentially uh, saw that was a big flaw in the business model because one driver can bring one car on the table, and the core skill set of the driver is to drive and not bring cars on the table. You know, in the Western world, since you give an example of the Western world, uh, the asset ownership in the U.S. It's about 800 cars per thousand people. And for the UK, it's about 700 cars per thousand people. Our neighbor China has about 250 cars per thousand people. In India, the asset ownership per thousand people is super low. Only 3% of Indians own uh, cars. And uh, it's a market uh, primarily of two wheelers. So we knew that there was a challenge around drivers owning cars. And that is something that we didn't want to get into. And drivers owning electric cars is probably, I don't know, is going to happen when we don't know that. So we had to come up with a supply side innovation. We believe fundamentally it's much easier to deal with five people than to deal with 100,000 people. So if we partner with global leasing institutions who have access to finance, access to cheap finance, access to long-term finance, they know the D of depreciation well, R of ride hailing well, M of mobility well, and, uh, and L of leasing well, we can partner with them. They can invest in electric cars as an asset class. And, you know, since me and Mole, my co-founder, we both have been in the solar space. Uh, we know how to build solar power plants, which were built by, which were funded by institutions. So we went back to large institutions who are investing in electric cars as an asset class and leasing electric cars to us. So that was a much easier problem to solve than to go and find drivers and ask them to buy an electric car. But I think some level of learning from the previous one and, and also access to capital uh, who would be knowing the industry better uh, does did help you in, in kind of getting the whole leasing up and running. Uh, just as an additional question, do you think then that could be a model, be a longer term solution because that is unique and how you build it up. But if you were to just broaden this and seeing as a leasing as a concept otherwise, uh, do you think that can be picked up in, in India? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, this business model is COVID proof, uh, is also weather proof. We survived three pandemic events. Uh, you know, most of the fleets in India have gone down by 50% because that business model was unsustainable and unscalable. In our case, the model is very, very scalable. Uh, institutions believe in, uh, you know, long term approach. So despite within the pandemic event, uh, three events now, India went through three pandemic events. We have grown 15x and we'll continue to uh, scale. We will have 4,000 electric cars. On the roads, in fact, it already plays orders of 4,000 cars on Tata Motors, uh, where uh, the institutions are buying those cars and leading to the BlueSmart platform. And going forward, we'll be scaling that model to about 10,000 cars across Delhi and in the next 18 months. We fundamentally believe that this decade is not of asset ownership. Uh, it's about asset monetization. So uh, in, let institutions own electric cars and let platforms like BlueSmart monetize them instead of encouraging uh, people from the poor Understood. section of society to own electric cars. That is something that we discourage. Understood. Great. Great. Uh, uh, getting uh, on Mr. Dave on, on to the thing. So Omega Seiki has launched the uh, M1KA, which is an EV SUV. Uh, so will EV SUVs overweight on uh, EV three-wheelers as a preferred choice, especially in the e-commerce segment? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. You see, we feel and our market uh, research shows that now the industry is uh, evolving from sub one ton to one ton plus payload segment. So sub one ton is usually the three wheeler. Now one ton plus is where the small uh, pickup trucks, uh, you know, come into play. And this is where we see that EV industry evolving very fast. Main driver is, of course, the e-commerce, you know, and uh, as we see, there is a huge uh, spike in the uh, business of all the main who believe that this is a segment which is going to convert to electric very fast. And uh, the sweet spot uh, in India, as we all know, is uh, one ton, one to uh, 1.5 ton, which is hugely dominated by Tata Ace. So this is where we want to play. And we, I do see that, uh, you know, uh, 
we will probably be the first uh, uh, in this segment. We are going to launch our vehicles in the next couple of months. Of course, there are challenges. There is a, uh, apart from the technology challenge, there is a uh, commercial uh, challenge to be overcome. Because unless uh, there is a government incentive, uh, EV is by and large not viable. Even even three wheelers also, you know, if uh, the cost of battery, powertrain, etc., is factored in, then uh, we have a challenge there. And today, the commercial vehicle, the trucks are not included in the frame uh, to list. So again, it's a bit of a chicken and egg because there was no vehicle, so they did not include it. And I'm very sure that you know our friend here from Niti Aayog, etc., will take our case and uh, take up to the policy makers. And I'm sure it, this is going to be sorted out. And then comes the uh, the technology, you know, the battery uh, of this size, about uh, 60, 70 kilowatt hour battery, then 20 kilowatt uh, motor uh, powertrain, and the whole electronics that goes into it, the whole packaging it of uh, it uh, in a proper technology uh, way, so that you have a high quality vehicle on road. So that is where the strength of the OEM uh, gets tested. And uh, we feel that we are there. We have a good product. We have tested it uh, extensively in-house, and we are ready to hit the market. And uh, so far, you know, whatever interaction we have had with customers, we we have a fantastic uh, response. We do believe that this is going to be a sweet spot for us. I'm I'm very positive and very uh, sort of uh, encouraged by the initial response. Excellent, excellent. So in that context, let me get Akash also, you know, with some of the very leading uh, e-commerce players, uh, I'm not taking the name, but uh, they are having ESG commitments globally, uh, right? And then they are pushing their partners to convert to the electric car. So how strong is that push and what, according to you, will propel this adoption going forward? Sure. So see, uh, I mean, whether it's the government push or whether it's the ESG mandate, one thing is very clear. uh, And we all know that the total cost of ownership of an electric vehicle, especially on the low, um, you know, uh, lower variants like a two wheeler or three wheeler is much better. Right. So it's a McKinsey study, which very clearly, you know, states that uh, a two wheeler and three wheeler are the, uh, you know, faster uh, to adopt form factors when it comes to electric and they are 40 percent cheaper on a total cost of ownership versus a similar IC engine bike. Right. So, yes, uh, there's a government push. Yes, uh, the the logistics players like, you know, the top e-commerce, food tech or grocery, uh, you know, players are looking to, uh, you know, adopt electric because of their own sustainability mandates. But at the end of the day, it's uh, the entire push is coming because uh, EVs make a lot of sense business wise. Right. Logistics is a very low margin business, especially when you talk about last mile logistics. Uh, It is the highest cost for all these businesses. And if they are. Uh, bringing that highest cost down by even 10, 20 percent, that saves a lot to them. Right. And hence, that is what, you know, our focus is at Zip Electric. We we are delivering close to, you know, uh, uh, you know, around a million shipments uh, a month now. Uh, right. Which is which is uh, for multiple players across the globe. And as Puneet rightly mentioned, you know, the financial reengineering of ensuring that the vehicle optimization and utilization works uh, for them much better because because if you see none of these companies today, uh, neither, you know, the e-commerce companies or the food tech companies have any vehicle on their books, right? They don't want to work uh, with vehicle ownership. They don't want to set up the charging infrastructure. Uh, they don't know how to maintain these EVs or spare parts. But one thing they want is they want to adopt electric. And hence, players like us who are managing this entire show for them, in terms of managing the EVs, managing the drivers and ensuring that they're getting a consistent experience, uh, um, not worried whether it's a petrol or EV. It is all electric and hence, you know, managing all their SLAs very well. Uh, and hence, at, at the end of the day, trying to save some cost for them is what is the agenda uh, that, that we feel is disruptive nationally, not just in a few pockets. So, panelists, I'm just quite conscious of the time, and I see there are about close to 30 plus questions in the Q&A. Uh, so, we'll be having limited time to that extent. Uh, so, feel free if you want to take some of those questions online and answer them as we speak, if it's going to be something which is relevant to you and you think add value. Uh, at least the participants will get those answers as much as they can. 
Uh, so feel free to jump in and do those answering. Uh, so let me uh, go to uh, Diego uh, next on, on the part. Also, in case of EV, uh, the three wheelers, the number of industry participants are quite uh, high. Uh, when will consolidation happen? And what will be the key factors for success for a EV, you know, three wheeler? I'm, I'm assuming you can also give a color probably in the two wheeler space is also similar to it. So even a broader uh, color also you can give if you have that kind of a view for it or specifically on three wheelers is also fine. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we have seen a quite high level of proliferation of uh, company startup uh, coming up both into wheel and wheel space into, into electric. Uh, uh, definitely one, uh, one main factor for this proliferation is due to the high level of incentive. Uh, uh, central government scheme, FAN2, and local incentive definitely are taking down the price of acquisition, rendering much more affordable this vehicle for a final customer that is giving a lot of incentivization for the companies to come up in this uh, in this field. Plus, uh, as uh, we, it has been uh, said also during the, the, the final discussion, for sure, two-wheeler and two-wheeler are the uh, more, more prominent sector to get the faster adoption to, to, to electric uh, because cost of ownership definitely is much more convenient respect to all the other sectors. These two factors combined together, plus also, let me say, also availability of technology of shelf for electric power train in India or outside India is also another factor that is uh, uh, seems to render easy to, 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 to launch a vehicle into EV space, both into wheeler and wheeler space. I think that going forward, there are some factors that will, will, will drive the consolidation of all these players. Uh, because for sure, as, as well as as far as the wheeler space is concerned, serviceability of a vehicle definitely is a very important factor. And unless you are capable to provide service to consumers, Pan India, mainly for this kind of technology, or uh, I presume that the sustainability of this product proposition from some players and doing the term will be quite at stake. Um, the second challenge that I see also for uh, uh, is uh, what is going to happen after FAN2 incentive uh, will, uh, will conclude after 2024. This is definitely, at least from my personal point of view, is a big question mark that is in my mind because uh, what is going to happen when uh, suddenly from one day to another we see price of vehicle going up 40, 45,000 for, for, for a normal conventional two-wheeler in electric space uh, is something that could uh, definitely hamper the, the growth unless uh, there is in parallel uh, a consistent movement in order to reduce uh, prices and cost of components uh, through localization as well as, for example, through PLI scheme. So if these two things is not, this uh, phenomenon is not going to happen, I think that uh, the sustainability of a lot of players uh, that now are coming up quite frequently is, could, be, could be a challenge. That's true. Understood. Uh, Mr. Dave, uh... Probably one of the last questions, and then probably we'll take on some of the Q and A's which has come up. Uh, so retrofitment uh, is now legally allowed. Uh, so do you foresee that to be a threat to the existing uh, EV three wheeler manufacturers? Well, this is a very interesting uh, discussion. You know, honestly, personally, if you ask, I am not a friend of uh, these kind of retrofitting or uh, you know the shortcut or Jugaad methods. You know, but there is, uh, having said that. You know, there is always a market for these kind of uh, businesses. If you go back 25, 30 years ago, you know, the, the factory fitted AC, for example, was not very common, you know, in Maruti cars, etc. And there was a huge market where they used to retrofit air conditioners, you know, around Delhi and you know. all. But as the market evolved and uh, the, the, fact, the cars got uh, factory fitted with ACs, etc., so that market vanished. So essentially what I'm saying is that the technology... Uh, uh, has to play a role here. It's I have no problem if the retrofitting kit is engineered well. It is it has a quality stamp or somebody is authenticating the uh, the kit in terms of safety, quality, durability. Then you know of course it can be seen. But uh, uh, it it may coexist in a way. Uh, particularly as I said, the market size is quite big. 
uh, and uh, people are always looking for uh, these kind of options. But uh, the, the technology and the quality of the kit and also the integration part has to be taken care of. The one thing that we have to keep in mind is that EV uh, is, is not like an IC engine. Here, the safety the, uh, you know, of, the, of the entire system uh, uh, matters a lot. And if you fiddle with it in a non-engineered way, then probably that's not the right way to do. So uh, my uh, views are that retrofit is probably not a, not a good option. But yes, it may coexist, uh, you know, in, in the, particularly in the initial years of uh, EV transition. Great. Um, I think uh, just a pause out here. Thank, thanks to all of you. This has been quite an you know, insightful session. We have got close to 40 plus questions out here, um, but we, you know, we need to take a pause out here. Uh, but we, before we move on to the next segment, which is the Q&A, I'd like to inform that we are, a feedback poll will shortly be visible on your screen. Uh, request uh, all the participants to share your feedback by selecting appropriate option. Uh, the poll will be live for 30 seconds. We'll just pause out here and just wait for the poll to uh, get over. So we'll just take about 10 to 15 minutes, seconds pause. Right. Uh, so just moving ahead with the Q&A part, let me start with uh, Puneet. See, under the EV taxi fleet model, uh, we know of a daily mobility of about 170 to 200 kilometers within a given territory. Do we have some percentage ratio that defines the charge points with respect to the vehicle a fleet size and numbers? Absolutely. So we, we, uh, we see a ballpark number of four cars is to one uh, charger. So going forward, the way we are building our charging infrastructure business is that if we are scaling to 4,000 cars, we're preparing about 1,000 chargers, which should be operational. These are fast chargers. And as we continue to expand our fleet, we're keeping a, we, we are trying to keep a ratio between 1 is to 4, although 1 is to 3 is ideal. But our utilization is highest in the world. We have seen that standalone charging infra companies normally achieve 15% or 12% utilization uh, of the charging infra, but all the blue smart chargers have 33% utilization, which is the highest in the world. Uh, and that gives us tremendous confidence that the math is working out. And we're trying to now keep that ratio of one is to four, ideally one is to three charger per, per, per car. And that's a good healthy ratio if, if you want to keep, uh, uh, you know, your charging infra business positive, bad positive. Got it. Excellent. Uh, I think specific numbers always helps. Thanks for that. Uh, so for uh, Dave, so how do you have the interoperability of uh, swappable batteries versus custom OEM wise swappable batteries? You know, what a bad quality one of the OEM destroy the credibility of a stronger uh, quality driven OEM in this regard? Sorry, I did not get the question correctly. What, so, what basically, question? so basically, if you have a custom one, which is there, which is interoperable with another one, a bad quality of one should not, uh, you know, damage the reputation of an, another part of it. Yeah. You see, this is, this is where the technology uh, has to come in. And uh, once you uh, swap your battery, your, your battery, presumably, uh, presumably the good battery with, with, something that uh, is there uh, to be swapped. So the system has to determine the quality of the battery and it has to, you know, give a red flag if the battery being swapped is not okay. So this is uh, where the technology will come in so that uh, a poor battery should not, uh, you know, impact your uh, vehicle. And uh, I think this is where uh, the uh, technology uh, has to play a role. Great. Okay. Uh, getting Mr. Graffy here, you know, how do you see the retail financing industry coming up for the EV uh, two-wheelers and the three-wheeler segment? You know, there's been a general talk that financing has been uh, a kind of a stumbling block. 
in the overall uh, adoption of EV in India? Well, as uh, as I said previously, uh, definitely one of the uh, definitely is a hard, is a challenge nowadays for EV, at least in uh, interwheel space. Uh, the availability of uh, effective retail finance scheme and the availability of the financial to support. I think that going forward, it will take some time, but going forward in the span of next 18 to 24 months, it will become, uh, how to say, a conventional portfolio for a lot of MBFCs. And going forward, uh, this kind of uh, reluctancy that we have seen recently will, will progressively fade. It's just a matter of taking some time to see more vehicles flying on road, more customers adopting. Uh, uh, this kind of solution and uh, the entire, how to say, retail finance system will self-adapt itself also to, to, to this kind of new normal, let me see, at least in, in the wheel space. As I said before, uh, this kind of, uh, how to say, transition can be accelerated under, how to say, uh, incentive, incentive scheme coming from, from government, like uh, preferred lending or something like that. So if it happens, then the transition may happen also much faster. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we'll get um, Shakash Gupta here. For two wheelers, which one has better uh, total cost of ownership, fixed battery or the swapping one? Uh, total cost of ownership wise, if you if you ask me, uh, we've consciously kept uh, being a fleet operator. See, uh, a B two C model would be very different, where a consumer would want to keep a fixed battery, and hence you know the battery has a longer shelf life. They can charge it once a day. They ride only 30, 40, 50 kilometers max. But being a fleet operator, which runs runs about 90 to 100 kilometers every day on every fleet, uh, right? Uh, we have essentially kept. Um, you know, both the options live on all our fleet, right? We have got 100% of our fleet uh, where uh, there are batteries which are fully swappable. And at the same time, you can even charge the battery separately, right? You don't have to rely on a swapping network because that's something that is, uh, you know, slowly coming up. We are working closely with a lot of players on the swapping side to have them built up the network together as we scale. But uh, But at the same time, uh, we feel that uh, it's easy on a two-wheeler side being a 10-kilo battery. Someone can pick it up, take it to their homes, put it on charge overnight, and then can do 100, 120 kilometers still, right? So so that's the way that we've kept a hybrid approach. And especially in the case of two-wheelers, it's much easier. Understood. Uh, let me just come back. Uh, Dave, uh, the difference in entry level EV and entry level of combustion level is huge. How can the same be trimmed both from the manufacturer side and from the banking side? The entry level vehicle is the cost, the cost part of it. Cost part. Of it. Yeah, that, that is a challenge that, uh, you know, we have to go through initially at the, uh, at the industry is at the nascent stage. So again, um, you know, there are basically uh, two or three aspects of it. One is the technology solves many of these challenges. And I do see that the way uh, battery uh, technologies are evolving. For example, uh, you know, uh, now we have sodium coming in with Reliance pumping in big money into it. And also Reliance as a whole, they are looking at uh, uh, this whole business as energy as a service kind of business model. And I do see that in India, next five to 10 years. So that, that is a, the cost challenge, you know, taken care of by technology from NNC, which uses most of these, uh, you know, uh, precious metals, etc. We have LFP and now we are talking about some other materials which are uh, commonly available. That is one. Secondly, of course, the once the scale comes, the costs come down. And uh, we are talking about, you know, roughly about 100 gigawatt of uh, battery capacity by 2030. If we go by the numbers that are being uh, talked about, 30% or 40% conversion. So uh, practically from just, uh, you know, uh, zero cell manufacturing or, or very negligible cell manufacturing 200 in almost under 10 years is a, is a huge uh, 
us. But I think with government support and industry coming in together and all these large corporates like Reliance, Adani, Tata, etc. pitching in, this is, this is going to be sorted out. So we will have the scale which will drive down the cost. Also, the technology will drive down the cost. So uh, eventually, maybe after uh, four or five years, I think there will be a parity. And I think we will. And this is uh, not factoring in the uh, uh, the subsidy part of it. Fame two, fame two, or government subsidies come in. Though that is an extra icing on the cake. But I do think that you know by the time, because of scale and technology and the overall ecosystem development, the cost challenge will be taken care of. Oh, right. Thanks. Uh, so a bit technical question here on the leasing part of it. Uh, address it to Puneet. Uh, Puneet, do you believe the market would be deeper for operating leases or you propose to go ahead with financial leases? Uh, in case of operating leases, how do you propose to tackle the residual value risk uh, if the leasing has to be really viable? Also, panelists, I mean, feel free to answer these questions. We are probably the last couple of uh, minutes to end the session. So, uh, there are more than 70 questions. And for the participants, we have taken down all, all these questions and we will answer them and get back to you and, and put it as part of our recording. Yeah, over to you, Puneet. So we have uh, in our current model only dry financial leases. So we partner with institutions who uh, invest in electric cars, take the risks of asset ownership and the responsibility for payment uh, for those electric cars. Uh, we and, and, they, and they have a simple uh, financial dry lease with us. We take complete ownership and responsibility of generating rides uh, based on those electric cars, and we are only uh, and we pay them a monthly lease amount. Uh, There's no operational lease with us. These are only dry financial leases going forward. This is what we believe is a long-term model for us. Okay, got it. So uh, this is a question for either to Rafi or Dave, and both of you, one of you could take this. So how will be the segment of sub uh, 3.5 ton commercial vehicle, electric vehicle be in the future? Sorry, I didn't get, uh, I, I lost for a while. Uh, how will the of Let's sub 3.5 ton, ton uh, commercial electric vehicle be in the future? Uh, sub 0.35 ton is a little bit above our, our capacity. But, uh, 3.5, yeah. Is definitely, it's very, very much higher. Uh, but I think that um, in general, uh, for commercial vehicle space, uh, there is a huge, uh, huge space for growth uh, into, into electric mobility. This is valid not only in India, but, 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 but globally. Um, I think that enabler for growth in every segment uh, definitely is uh, related to mainly supply chain evolution. This is at least my, 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 my opinion in the sense that uh, the, the big challenge, the big restriction that we see now of growth uh, is uh, preparedness of supply chain here in India. In terms of localization of components, in terms of cost of components, in terms of uh, availability of them, uh, in terms of capacity of production. This is the biggest hurdle that I see at least in the span of the next two, three years uh, to enable uh, the growth uh, into Commercial vehicle space for for any kind of, of of segment, independent if it is sub one ton or it is a, a one point five ton or sub one three point five ton. Um, PLI scheme definitely could help, in my opinion, my perspective, to to help this uh, this faster adoption. So I see that, uh, in my opinion, it will take uh, not short time. It will take minimum three to five years to have a clear established and structured supply chain for all components of electric, the benefit is powertrain, battery pack, uh, whatever we are talking about. It will not be short, uh, short time solution. Understood. Okay. So an interesting question on the whole sustainability part of it. So how do you see EV adoption generating opportunities for carbon credits uh, trading here in India? I can take that because we've done some study on this. So I think it's a big opportunity. That's the last leg of the entire, you know, EV life cycle. Uh, Post recycling that how do you get all these credits and how you can, you know, monetize them? Because just a case in point, which I read somewhere that Tesla's 
Uh, I think two years back, Tesla's largest revenue stream was carbon credits rather than, you know, uh, the sale of cars, right? So, so that's a huge, um, you know, model. Uh, but India is quite nascent. We, in fact, wrote uh, a request to the government also uh, to see that if that can be, you know, a channel in India. There are platforms like Gold Standard and Vera, which are doing this internationally, European. Um, you know, there's a carbon trading exchange which is also available, you know, in the international market where you can actually trade these carbon, uh, you know, credits that you generate. But uh, the good, uh, the good point, and I think Randir, uh, Mr. Randir would have been able to help here much better because government is working towards the entire carbon credit policy for India also. And hopefully that should come out sometime this year, uh, which is what is the expectation. And then I think it will become disruptive where you can trade your carbon coins and credits versus the, you know, non uh, or highly polluted companies can trade with the green coins and stuff like that. But yeah, that's work in progress. Okay. With that note and hope, uh, I, I think we really run short of time. Um, we are 4.15. So I'd like to conclude this session. We still have quite a few questions which are unanswered. If any further question you want that to be answered, please write to events at Crystal. I tried to answer a few. Yeah, you did. Thanks for that, uh, Akash. Really appreciate that. Uh, that's EVENTS at crystal.com. Uh, we will come back and uh, thanks to all of you, the panelists. Over to you, Ritika. Quite an insightful session, I would say. Uh, while I close the session, on behalf of Crystal, I convey our sincere thanks to all of you for taking part in today's webinar. We hope that you found today's discussion insightful and timely. We also hope that your queries have been answered satisfactorily. I express my deep felt thanks to the speakers for the evening today, uh, Mr. Randhir Singh, Mr. Dia Geography, Dr. Dev Mukherjee, Mr. Puneet Goel, and Mr. Akash Gupta for sharing the insights, experiences, and precious time today. With this, we conclude today's uh, webinar and look forward to connecting with you in our upcoming webinars next month on various topics like uh, fertilizers, real estate, dairy, auto components, etc. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, Rajiva. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.